Uh, I'm going to have to get used to the fancy screen here. Um, <coughs> is, it, is it visible? Is it too washed out? It's a, uh, an old map that uh, shows the townships of, uh, of Franklin County. Uh, the initial survey of the architectural resources in Franklin County occurred in 1974 and 1975, as Claudia uh, just mentioned, and was performed by staff from the State Historic Preservation Office and Gilbert Pierce, the County Health Inspector and Historian. A total of 164 rural properties and 39 urban resources were surveyed, focusing predominantly on buildings built up to 1865. In late 1976 and early 1977, some of the resources were revisited as part of the Tar Noose survey, but no re uh, new resources were added. Many of these resources were documented in Philbert Pierce's The Early Architecture of Franklin County, which was published in 1977. Pierce documented several additional resources for a second update edition that was published in 1988. In 1986, much of the town of Lewisburg was surveyed for the preparation of the National Register of Historic Places nomination for the Lewisburg Historic District. In 2014, Franklin County received grant monies to undertake a reconnaissance level update of the existing records and survey a substantial number of previously unreported resources. The major goal of the reconnaissance survey were to update the existing SHPO files or the Historic Preservation Office files for properties in the county's unincorporated areas, unincorporated areas, as well as the municipalities of Bunn and Centerville, and to conduct a reconnaissance survey of the entire county to identify and partially report additional previously undocumented properties meriting survey. The survey included the following steps. The first step was the inspection of approximately 233 previously surveyed resources outside the existing historic districts in Franklinton, Lewisburg, and Youngsville to determine if they were still standing, altered, or deteriorated, demolished, or moved. Pictures were taken of the primary and secondary resources, and the HBO database was updated for each property. The most significant results from the update survey for the previously reported resources are as follows. Unfortunately, of the 233 previously recorded resources, 114 do not survive. So that's quite a large number. Uh, this is one of the buildings that was still standing in the 1970s when it was surveyed, and as you can tell, at least the chimneys were standing. Uh, some buildings that could not even find a single trace of what might have been there. 27 of the previously recorded resources were, are listed in the National Register. Uh, fortunately, unfortunately, one of these had been demolished, the Dr. J.A. Savage House, which stood in Franklinton, and two have been moved, one of which is the Shamuel Kearney House, which you see on the screen here, which was fairly recently moved and is in the process of being restored. The other house that was moved is the Clifton House, uh, which was actually only moved a short distance from its original location, but as you can tell, it's in, uh, in excellent condition. Other properties that are listed in the National Register remain in good to excellent condition, such as the Dr. Samuel Perry House, which you see on the screen here, uh, which was built by uh, Jacob Holt, which was a, 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 one of the few known uh, builders in North Carolina in the 19th century, and has actually I've encountered him in Hertford County as well, uh, and he's uh, quite well known. Another great example of a house that's on the National Register that had been lovingly restored, the Jones Wright House. Uh, the Person McGee House, which is not only a great example of a Queen Anne style dwelling, but also boasts uh, an enormous amount of outbuildings that show the history of agriculture in uh, Franklin County. KC, K KC, KC. Uh, it's also uh, a magnificent property uh, with a large number of uh, surviving outbuildings. And KC Mill, which is located within the National Register boundary of the house, uh, which is also a spectacular building uh, and is also being in the process of being restored. Among the previously recorded resources are also 11 resources 
which have been placed on the study list, which is a designation uh, given by the State Historic Preservation Office for buildings that are potentially eligible for the National Register. And one of these is the uh, Dr. A.S. Harris House. Uh, the house itself is 1860 Greek Revival. The porch is a, is a later addition. Uh, the Robidoux House and Barn, uh, which also have been, uh, have been restored since they were originally surveyed in the, uh, in the 1970s. This house dates to the late 18th, early 19th century. Uh, the McLemore Kennedy House, uh, an early 19th century uh, dwelling, which is, uh, I guess, waiting for, uh, for somebody to take care of it, but it's still uh, in fairly good condition for not being lived in. And then the Traveler's Rest, which is at a stagecoach stop associated with the Purnell House. Unfortunately, the Purnell House burned down in 1977, but the stagecoach stop is still in, uh, in good condition. They also looked at schools back in the, in the 70s. Uh, this is the Concord Elementary School, and this is one of 14 Rosenwald schools that was built in the county. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background on Rosenwald schools, in case you're not familiar with them, uh, in the 19-teens, the Chicago uh, philanthropist uh, Julius Rosenwald, who was actually the president of uh, Sears Roebuck and Company, uh, became aware of the sad state of education among African Americans in the South, and his response was the establishment of a fund that provided architectural plans and matching grants that helped build more than 5,300 schools from Maryland to Texas between the late 1910s and 1932, and more than 800 uh, Roosevelt schools were built in North Carolina. And 14 of these were built in Franklin County between 1921 and 1929. Uh, unfortunately, only a few of them survived, uh, this being one of them. Uh, here's another example of a house that's uh, actually more complex because there's also several outbuildings that are associated with the, uh, that are on the, uh, on the state study list. There are also five resources uh, that were previously recorded that had been determined eligible, or DOE, and that are still standing. Uh, the DOE is a designation given to resources uh, that have been reviewed as part of what is known as Section 106 process, and which is conducted by federal agencies uh, during project planning. Uh, all of these five resources were examined by the Department of Transportation during uh, road project planning and are recommended eligible for the National Register. So combined with the ones that are on the National Register or in the National Register and the study list and then the DOE, these already have an extra level of protection for any development that might occur. Another house, another property that was determined eligible is the Harris House, which is just south of Lewisburg here on 401. And then perhaps uh, somewhat unusual uh, is this, uh, this, this rock with a tomb on top. You can just see the, the, the plaque here, uh, dates to 1874, and it's the last resting place of uh, William A. Jeffries, Jr., who was a, a state senator from Franklin County from uh, 1844 until 1845 when he passed away. And the stonework is by a uh, Scottish stonemason by the, the name of McGowan. Unfortunately, not all of the properties that survive remain in, in good condition. Uh, nine of these previously recorded uh, had deteriorated substantially since they were originally surveyed in the 1970s, uh, the Kearney Gupton House being one of them. And you can see how the, the bottom sill has sagged, and of course the chimneys uh, have deteriorated as well. Um, this house is in, in potentially worse state. Unfortunately, the, uh, uh, the owners had planned to restore the building, but the husband passed away, and so the, the process has been halted. But there are others that are off worse, such as this house, where um, 
you know, nature is uh, slowly taken over and there's not much uh, left to, uh, you know, probably in a couple of years, uh, you won't be able to know that there was a building here in the first place. Uh, fortunately, there are still houses that, that remain a lot of integrity, high level of integrity, and that are, um, are potential candidates for the study list. One of these is the Foster House, and this also may have been uh, built by Jacob Holt. Uh, and this, uh, this house, uh, other than an addition that was built in the early 20th century at the back, is more or less original to when the, when the house was built. This property is also uh, uh, suggested, or could be potential for the study list, Holly Grove. Uh, it, the house dates to about 1851. There may have been some additions. It's not clear if the dormers are original to the house, uh, but it comes with a large number of outbuildings, uh, again, that give you an idea of, uh, of farming practices in the county uh, during the 19th and early uh, 20th century. And then finally, oops, oh, shoot. Okay, here comes the technical one. Okay. Finally, Shiloh Baptist Church, also a potential candidate for the study list. Um, they did add a uh, fellowship hall to the side of the building, uh, but they took a fairly inconspicuous breezeway to connect the two buildings and it still retains its original siding and this very decorative uh, trim along the, the gable ends. Of the surviving resources, uh, several contained unusual features that contribute to the history of the county. So we didn't just look at, at houses, but we looked at other parts as well, one of which is this uh, stone man that sits in front of the Vines Turner house. Uh, which supposedly was carved by an Irishman uh, working on the railroad. And, and you can see the house in the background, but the, uh, I think the, the, I don't know how many of you may have seen this, this little statue, but it's uh, quite unusual uh, to come across it in any part of North Carolina. So, And then I, for one, did not know that there was gold in them hills. Uh, located in the gold mine township of the county uh, are the remnants of the old Porter's gold mine. Uh, apparently both Mark Twain and Thomas Edison visited the mine. Uh, mining began as early as, as 1835 and three million dollars worth of gold was shipped to the U.S. Mint from this uh, mine and it was closed in uh, 1935. Uh, now it basically sits in a, a clear-cut area and uh, it, it was quite a quest to find it. Um, but there's still you know, bits and pieces left, and again, it, it contributes to the, the history of the county. Franklin County is also home to numerous mills. Uh, several of them survive. Uh, in some cases, it's only the mill pond or the dam or, or some of the equipment that survives. But fortunately, there's quite a number of, uh, of mills that have, uh, have lasted. Another uh, unusual uh, building in uh, the county, uh, most of the houses were about either built out of log or, or lumber, timber, uh, some out of brick. Uh, this stone house near uh, Rocky Ford is, is uh, unusual. Of course, you've seen chimneys that are built out of the stone, local stone or foundations, but a whole house. Uh, this is a one-room house, and the walls are 18 inches thick. And there's a date of 1794 carved on the uh, inside, on the to the left of the door. So this is a is a fairly old house. I was told by the people living behind it that there's some connection with Jesse James, which I cannot <laughs> confirm or deny. Uh, another intriguing building, and, and as you will notice, some of the uh, we we looked at a lot of properties. Uh, some of the slides that you're seeing now are, are properties that I was, you know, that, that caught my eye and that I was intrigued by. Uh, this is a, an enclosed water tower. Uh, the people that I encountered that told me that I could not take pictures, so I took this one from the right of way. Uh, they said it was an old windmill, uh, but it's probably an enclosed water tower with the, the <laughs> reservoir at the top 
and I learned through talking to other people in the county that it was probably a hydraulic ram pump that would have pumped the water from a nearby spring to the container, to the cistern at the top of the tower, that, which would then ensure that there was enough pressure or, or continuous pressure for, uh, for it feeding the, the house or any other of the buildings out there. Uh, the second step uh, was the reconnaissance survey of the county outside the municipal boundaries of Franklinton, Lewisburg, and Youngsville to identify previously undocumented properties that merited survey. Uh, we ended up surveying 325 new uh, resources. Uh, the first, and, and Claudia mentioned that uh, as well in her, in her opening statement, uh, the first requirement is that they have to be older than 50 years. So technically, it could be anything that was built in 1965 or before. That may seem a little bit odd, but uh, there, you know, that's that's how it, how it works. And next year it's going to be 19, or this year it's going to be 1966, and so on. Um, the properties we had some additional, uh, you know, criteria. Uh, the properties have to be uh, good examples of a certain style or period or purpose. Uh, and also, there had to be a you know, certain level of integrity. It could just be any, any kind of house with vinyl siding and vinyl windows that was perhaps built in 1900, because you know, there, there might have been better examples. So, for instance, a good example of a Queen Anne style dwelling, or perhaps a type of tobacco barn, or a school, uh, we would have looked at, but also more modern buildings uh, were considered and actually surveyed. Uh, we also looked at some deteriorated properties uh, because of their historic significance and what they could tell us about the environment uh, and uh, or the history of Franklin County and its inhabitants. So they weren't all you know, buildings that people lived in or that you could move in right away. Now the county can be divided up in, in 17 quadrangles or quads, and you see that on the, the red outline is the, the county line, and then the names you see in there in the, the rectangular boxes are what are known as quadrangles. And so we divided them up, and basically to have some cons or organization in it, we surveyed by, by quadrangle. Uh, now, no resources were reported on the sections of the Afton, Vicksboro, and Wilton quads that fall within the county. So that's these two up here, and then this little sliver down here. There, there are buildings in there, but they were either not, you know, did not have the integrity or were not old enough. On five of the quads, uh, we surveyed between two and eight resources. On nine. We did two dozen or more, and then the highest concentration of resources was reported on the Bun East, Franklinton, and Gold Sand quads. So that's this section of the county down here, Franklinton, and then Gold Sand up here. Now, all of the exact numbers you can find in the, in the final report, which was uh, produced as part of this project, and I know that Maury has a has a copy of that. So. Uh, uh, the level of effort was uh, slightly more than that for a normal reconnaissance survey, which usually is just like you know, a single picture and a single line. Uh, multiple pictures were taken of the properties and of the uh, associated outbuildings, and uh, a summary description was written, and these were entered into the uh, State Historic Preservation uh, Office database, similar to what we did for the first phase. <coughs> So now I just want to sort of give you a brief chronological journey of the, uh, of the architecture of the, of the county, the, the buildings that I encountered, again, just to give you a, an idea of what is out there. Um, this was a, uh, I, a, one of the descendants of the, the Wheelis family uh, was kind enough to, to schlep me up a mountain to find this building because you would not, it's not visible from the road and you really would have to know that it's there. Uh, the house was probably built before 1850. Uh, again, it's not, it's not occupied, it's uh, somewhat run down, but you can still learn a lot about the history of the county, and especially, I don't know how visible it is, but this is some of the trim <coughs> horse around on the inside, and you can tell by the level of detail, the attention that was paid to you know, making it, that when this was built, this was a, a fine house. This was, you know, uh, 
um, a, a lot of attention was given to it. Uh, some buildings are perhaps more plain, uh, but again, no less important. Uh, this is an example of uh, what is known as a, as a coastal cottage or a, a coastal Carolina cottage. Um, it's actually a, a log dwelling, uh, and you probably couldn't tell from looking at the, at the weatherboard siding, but unfortunately it deteriorated at one of the front corners, and you could see the logs underneath. Uh, also an interesting feature which you see uh, across the county, some people would have had enough money to get their stones cut and get a nice stone chimney. Others would have used field stone, slapped plaster on it, and then scored it to look like uh, cut stone. Uh, here's another example of a, uh, of a log house, probably dates around 1870. Um, again, you can't really tell from looking at this picture because of the siding that's on it, one little telltale sign, and I don't know how well it's visible for everybody in the room, is the, is the depth of the window. So if it, sits, if it sits back, that usually means that it's against the back of the, the logs themselves. Or if you have a frame house, the window is usually flush uh, with, the, with the siding. Uh, another interesting feature of this house was the breezeway between the dwelling <laughs> section and then the kitchen in the back. Again, telling us about how you know, people's sensibilities about cooking and, and separation of all these different functions within a household uh, changed. Another example of a building uh, that, that can tell us about uh, you know, changing trends in, in, uh, in architectural styles. Uh, there's, there's two things going on in this house. The oldest part is probably Greek Revival, which is very sort of austere. It has a, a pyramidal roof, and then you have the corner boards here. Uh, this, this fancy trim along the edges of the roof was probably added at a later period, again, to, to show how the taste of people changed. And probably, you know, keeping up with the Joneses, because if somebody else has it, then you have to have it too. Uh, houses also were enlarged to accommodate growing families or to show that you know you you start off with a small dwelling you you know you start farming you make money you can build a larger house uh, the Charlie H Wheelis house here uh, was built in, in at least two stages the oldest date back to around 1880 which is actually this section it was a one room plan this section closest to you with the chimney on it. And then around 1906, they added the rest of the house to it. Again, it, it looks like a typical, what is known as a triple A roof house that you see across the county and across the state. But if you look at it more closely, then you can you know, discover all these li little details about how these were constructed. Uh, this piece of trim here actually gives you the line of where the old part of the house was, which is that log interior, and then where the new part of the house was added on to. Uh, just a very small house. Again, they come in, in various shapes and sizes. Uh, also to show you that, unfortunately, the weather over the summer wasn't always nice when I was doing field work. Um, a, basically a one-room plan that uh, looks like it, it's also sometimes referred to as a store in a jump. So you would have had enough room up here to, to have a sort of an attic space and then it would have had a, a lean-to or a shed at the back of the house uh, where they probably had some of the, the kitchen functions if it didn't have a separate uh, summer kitchen. A uh, much larger, uh, more fancy house, Banks Hill, from around 1900. It's uh, near Catesville. Uh, it's a colonial revival style dwelling. Uh, the, the grand porch, that temple front, uh, is sometimes associated with the southern colonial revival. Uh, you probably houses here in Lewisburg as well that are, are similar, uh, of a similar design. What's unusual about the combination or this, this dwelling in specific is these, uh, the, the jerk and head roof or the truncated the clips here at either end, which is not something that you usually uh, combine uh, with, this, uh, with the Southern Colonial Revival. Uh, this was one of five houses built 
in that vicinity by a man named Banks. I did not find out what his first name was or other than I was told by the lady who lives here that his son was a dentist. So I don't know if anybody else knows anything more, but he also owned the bank store, uh, which you can see if you're, I think it's if you're driving on 56 to Franklinton. And then he built the bank's house, which is also along the road there. Uh, a grand house near uh, Youngsville, which was built by uh, John F. Mitchell around 1905. Uh, he owned about 3,000 acres uh, west of Youngsville and operated the lumber mill and supply company in the, in the town itself. And uh, this is also a, uh, um, a very grand house uh, on a stone foundation. Uh, has some elements, you know, wraparound porch, some elements from the, the Queen Anne style. Again, they, they come in you know, various grades of, of Queen Anne. There's, I know there's some very grand Queen Anne houses here in, in Lewisburg as well. Uh, this is a slightly you know, plainer version. Another style of uh, architecture that was popular uh, not only in, in Franklin County, but also in North Carolina and in the United States at the beginning of the 20th century, the first half of the 20th century, the craftsman style uh, this is uh, Charles Howard, the Charles Howard House. Uh, Charles Howard was the first principal of uh, Gold Sand High School and also a minister at the nearby uh, Mount Zion Baptist Church. And I was told that the stone was actually brought in by uh, local families for the, for the construction of the house. Uh, another uh, craftsman bungalow. Uh, this one is somewhat unusual. It's brick. It's painted brick. Uh, the unusual feature is this large uh, sort of portico at the front. Um, as you can tell, I like craftsman style houses, but um, this one probably dates to around 1935. Uh, just some features that are usually associated with the craftsman style are these little brackets or gallows brackets that support the overhang of the roof on the sides and then the exposed rafter tails. Uh, the porch usually has the battered, the box columns uh, that you're probably familiar with. And then also a feature of the craftsman style are the, um, the windows, the sash windows with a single pane at the bottom and then a sort of unusual uh, number of panes at the top, either three or four or nine or like more like a geometric pattern like you see here. Uh, here we get to the more modern uh, stuff. Uh, again, it's not just old buildings that we look at. Uh, this geodome uh, was inspired or potentially uh, constructed by um, there was a man named uh, an architect, Richard Buckminster Fuller, who coined the phrase uh, geodesic dome and he sort of developed a technology in the 1940s while he was actually teaching in North Carolina. He also opened a firm in Raleigh uh, called Geodesic Inc. and they created these small domes uh, for, you know, among others, the United States Marine Corps because they were you know, convenient to, to schlep around and to, to construct. Uh, a more common, probably, ranch-style house, although uh, a very fine one. Uh, this was actually built by uh, Mr. Uh, Preddy himself, and he, uh, he had seen the stone, the crab orchard stone, and he went to Tennessee and he ordered it and they shipped it back to, uh, to his house and he built it on the, basically in his spare time. So, uh, and it's still probably untouched since, uh, since he's still living there. Um, so he built it between 1957 and 1962. And probably the most modern house, this is just west of, uh, of Youngsville, uh, a modernist house. Uh, I did not encounter too many of them during uh, the survey work. Um, but again, it's part, of the, it's part of the history of Franklin County and it, it tells you how, you know, how people were influenced by architectural trends and, how they wanted to you know, keep up with the times. Uh, as part of the newly recorded 
buildings, I recorded uh, 28 stores. Uh, this is a very uh, nice example from around uh, 1910. Uh, there's still a large number of stores or old service stations uh, across the county as you drive the back roads and the, and the crossroads. Uh, you know, in, in various degrees of, uh, of repair, uh, this one is, is uh, well taken care of. This one is slightly less well taken care of. Uh, another interesting feature uh, is the associated dance hall, which is this part. The store is in this section, the dance hall is here. And that's the interior of the dance hall, and I was informed by uh, some other locals that it was a, a popular uh, pastime on the weekends to basically go from one dance hall to another and to, you know, pick up girls or pick up boys, I guess, uh, talk to a man, so he was picking up girls. But, um, so it, it's, again, I guess it's interesting for me, since I wasn't from 1910, but uh, to see how, you know, how people spent their time and, and how, I guess, it's changed now for us in, in today's society. Uh, another store uh, near, uh, I think this one's also near White Level. Uh, the aerial still showed the wing that has been demolished. I don't know if it was a dwelling that was associated with the store or if it was a um, uh, additional storage space. This store is also in, uh, in or near white level. Uh, this was in, in a fairly good condition. Uh, it was associated with a, a house with a lot of outbuildings as well. Um, something that's, you know, for the, for the next phase, the comprehensive survey, would be interesting to find out some of the, the family backgrounds and the, and the history of these properties. Because at this point, I just, you know, looked at the buildings and not so much of the, the history behind them. Uh, store near uh, Kearney, um, or Kirk Kearney, 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 apologize, um, has seen better times, unfortunately, but again, it gives you an idea of, of how these were used uh, over time, uh, the different, I mean, there are similarities between these stores, but there's also differences based on, on function and uh, how they were utilized. We also looked at churches. We documented about 24. Again, similar to the dwellings that we looked at, uh, they are reflective of the styles that were popular at the time. Uh, this is a very nice uh, neoclassical revival example. Uh, the columns are actually, the ionic columns are actually wood, um, which oftentimes they've been you know, replaced over time. This church probably dates around 1900. Uh, more common uh, across the county are the, these little Gothic Revival uh, churches. Uh, the, uh, uh, it still has its original windows, which is nice to see. Here's another example. Uh, this one was recently uh, received, I think, a new addition off the back. So some of these are changes, changing, of course, to keep up with the demands of the congregation. Another example of a uh, of a Gothic revival uh, church. Again, as you can see, it's not they're not all one is all the same. They they use different you know forms of inspiration. Um, early twentieth century uh, church uh, classical revival. Uh, the brickwork around the it had buttresses. Uh, these features here are referred to as coins. And then it had really nice brickwork around the uh, around the entrance itself. Church may be earlier. I think the tax record said it was 1955. This may be one of the churches that, at some point, they decided to, to add brick veneer to the exterior, which is not uncommon for uh, North Carolina. Uh, I was struck by the uh, unusual. Uh, pillars that carry the, uh, the, the front of the portico, basically, which I had not seen before. A, a very small dwelling uh, converted into a church. Um, 
again, we try to we try to cover as much as possible to, to, to get an idea of what is out there, not just look for high style buildings, um, but also perhaps look for the more unusual. I have not found out any of the history of this building. I did try to contact the pastor, but um, she was not home. Uh, we documented uh, 19 farm complexes across the county. Uh, Franklin County is still predominantly agricultural county, and a lot of the old farm complexes uh, fortunately still survive. Um, as with the other examples that I've shown you, uh, we did not record all of them. We just did not have the, the time. It was not you know, within the scope of the project. Uh, but usually what we looked for was a, a, a large number of intact outbuildings that would tell you a little bit more about what kind of farming took place. Um, oftentimes you can, you, know, you can label it as general farming, uh, but in some cases you can you know, determine whether or not they were predominantly tobacco or may have had uh, cattle or anything like uh, I came across a uh, seed farm as well. Um, this farm, the the dwelling is potentially later, it may have replaced an earlier dwelling, but there was a large number of, uh, of outbuildings, large number of tobacco barns, uh, and, a, and a larger barn in the back, and also there were two uh, poultry barns on the property. Uh, this was the, uh, the, the seed barn, the seed farm uh, that I uh, was introduced to, um, and for me personally, uh, you know, getting an opportunity to go into a barn and, and experience the, uh, the open structure is always, uh, uh, always nice. The farmhouse you see here uh, was built around 1904 by a carpenter named John Young uh, for John and Aldonia Wheelis. Uh, you will have noticed that I've come across uh, several I've shown you several wheelers properties. Again, that was thanks to the, the, the person that, uh, that showed me around and said, oh, you need to talk to this person, you need to meet my cousin, and you need to meet this person. And then you get a lot more of the family background and the history of the properties. Uh, the original log dwelling is inside this building, and there were uh, a large number of uh, outbuildings that survived on this, uh, on this property as well. Uh, the Zali uh, Pierce Farm, again, the house is probably a later uh, addition, replacing an earlier uh, structure. Uh, an unusual feature of this farm was the, uh, there's a horse stable and a corn crib and a barn that were located behind the, the main house itself and, and formed somewhat of a, of a courtyard. Usually the buildings are either strung out or they're sort of randomly spread across the farm and this formed a little courtyard uh, behind the main house. So I had not uh, encountered that before. Uh, example of what probably was predominantly a tobacco uh, farm, uh, the Breedlove Farm, uh, which had a very large number of, uh, of tobacco barns. I think it's near Gold Sand. Uh, another barn that, uh, that struck me from a distance because of its big uh, silver roof that you can see from, uh, from quite a distance, uh, the Dean Farm, uh, it was one of the few, uh, uh, well, it was the only uh, banked uh, dairy barn, so you have a ramp that leads up to the upper floor and then you have your, uh, your milking operation in the, on the lower floor. Uh, another feature, something to sort of you know, to, to realize when you look at this, that originally this whole, oops, there we go again. <laughs> this whole structure, this whole space upstairs was just one open hayloft. There was nothing in there. So um, just from a structural point of view, an engineering point of view, these buildings are pretty neat to look at as well. The bachelor's farm, also, uh, I mean, some of these buildings, uh, I think this may have had vinyl windows or vinyl siding, so that detracts a little bit from, from the integrity of the building, but it's the, it's the combination of the house and then all of the outbuildings. It had 
Uh, I think this was a combination of an ordering house and a pack house. Uh, the summer kitchen, the original summer kitchen was log, and they had the original well. Uh, they had several uh, tobacco barns on the property as well, and, and this was probably more of a general farmer, uh, although you know, focusing based on what's left, focusing on, on tobacco. And then finally, from the farms, uh, the, the Pritchard Farm, which is uh, off of uh, at Faulkner Road, uh, which according to the uh, tax data could date to around 1840. Uh, again, some of these things probably need to be checked and, and reconfirmed for, uh, for a later phase to make sure um, the tax dates are not always as reliable. Um, this also was a very nice complex with a, a fair number of outbuildings. Uh, interesting feature here was the, uh, the well on the back porch of the, of the house itself. Uh, we looked at 11 schools uh, during this part of the survey. Uh, education was an important aspect of the county's development uh, and became more organized at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, the building you see here uh, was built as the first consolidated school in Franklin County around uh, 1907. Uh, it's a very imposing uh, sort of colonial revival style uh, building constructed of brick. I do believe it's for sale, so if you're interested. Um, uh, slightly less grand, but uh, nonetheless important, uh, Rock Springs School of around 1910. Uh, it originally held uh, six grades, uh, and by 1927 it closed and its students were moved to uh, Bunn, which is just to the south of it. Uh, Copeland Perry School uh, is one, is what is known as a, uh, a three-teacher Rosenwald school. So it was built according to the specifications uh, provided by uh, the Rosenwald Fund. Uh, again, it's one of the 14 uh, Rosenwald schools built in Franklin County that still survive. It's now uh, cut up into apartments, but it's still you know, standing. Uh, I encountered this school, I think it's also on 56 heading toward uh, Franklinton. And I was told by people there that it was moved from a location on River Road. Um, it's not really clear. Uh, that was all the information I got, so I have no clue what the school, where the school came from exactly, or who it's associated with. It sort of looks like a Rosenwald school, uh, but it's not completely. It's, for one thing, it's too narrow, because I don't know if you can see they turned it into, they raised it on this concrete block foundation and they turned it into a garage or a truck storage building. So it's only basically one bay deep. Um, but it's also not uncommon for other schools that were built during that period that they may have borrowed Rosewall plans or they may have been you know, adjusted to, uh, to meet the needs of the, uh, the school that they were building. The uh, original Edward Best Elementary School, uh, nice use of brick. Again, hopefully you can see it with the uh, different uh, panels in the, in the brickwork itself. <coughs> uh, the old uh, Wood School, uh, the school was converted to a church in the 1950s, at which point they turned this wing into a, uh, into a sanctuary and they changed the windows. Now, I was talking to the pastor, and he said, well, there's a former student that lives nearby, and he has old photographs. So I made the, you know, drove by there, and fortunately, they had the picture of what the school looked like originally. So that was, uh, was nice to see as well. So um, I'm sure there's probably lots of people out there that have old school pictures from, from family members uh, to, you know, illustrate what, the, what some of these buildings look like. For instance, like this one. Uh, the new Harris School, only two of the wings of the original school survived. There used to be a whole building sitting in front of here. Uh, this is the older wing, which was built in 1925, and these wings were built in uh, 1975 when the school was expanded. The uh, Pierce School uh, is now associated with the church that's located next to it. 
Again, they've, a lot of these buildings, they've made the windows smaller, probably to save on energy, but of course it changes the appearance of the, of the buildings. Uh, what's left of the uh, Justice School, it's the old auditorium. Uh, the main school no longer survives. Uh, it had been used as a church, but they abandoned it as well. Uh, it was probably built by the uh, uh, WPA, by the Works Progress Administration, between 1933 and 1939. Now, during the survey, I also learned a lot of interesting things about the, the built environment of the county, um, or more than just the built environment of the county. Um, and some of the buildings, despite being deteriorated, they can still tell us a whole lot. Uh, this, for instance, uh, and it's, as you can tell, it's overgrown. Um, it could date, date back to around 1800, and it, um, it's said to have been the stagecoach stop for uh, Rubentown, which later became uh, Centerville. And there was an enclosed porch with flush boards, and I don't know how well you can read it, it was hard to decipher, uh, but we believe that this says June 6th, 1857. So it may have been left by somebody traveling through there and, uh, you know, the, I wouldn't say vandals are nothing new, it's not something of our time to, you know, write everything or, or to, you know, leave your mark somewhere. Uh, but it definitely, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting feature to come across and to you know, tell you a little bit about the history of the county. Uh, doing these kinds of surveys, you, you also start to recognize certain patterns. Uh, this is, these buildings were all on the, uh, uh, near Epsom, on the Ingleside Quad, and they're all sort of similar houses. You know, there's what was known as an eye house, but then they have this projecting central bay uh, they're all slightly different, but they're all similar as well. So you can start to wonder, uh, is it, you know, keeping up with the Joneses? So this person built a house. Oh, here we go again. Um, so this person built a house, and he wants to look at the same and so on. Or is it just the same builder who knows only one way to build. Um, interesting features within the houses, this one for instance, the projecting bay, uh, I had not seen that before, on the first floor it had rounded corners uh, on the, the entrance vestibule.